Welcome to Energy Law with Energy Law Prof. Today we're going to talk about some federalism issues and clean energy policy issues that we'll see recurring throughout our course on energy law. So first, let's talk about one of the foundational cases on federalism in energy policy, and that's FPC versus Florida Power and Light. This is a Supreme Court case from 1972. Now, FPC is the Federal Power Commission. That's the precursor to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, that we've talked about some already in the class. And the Federal Power Commission was given jurisdiction by Congress over transmission in interstate commerce and wholesale sales. As we've talked about before in class, wholesale sales of electricity are when you sell electricity, not to the person that will ultimately use that electricity, but to somebody who will sell it to the customer that uses it. So you're not making a retail sale to the ultimate consumer, you're selling it to another party who in turn uh, will sell it to a customer. So that's what a wholesale sale is. And the Federal Power Act gives the Federal Power Commission jurisdiction over transmission in interstate commerce, as well as these wholesale sales of electricity. Now, the Florida Power and Light, which formerly known as Miami Beach Electric, one of Florida's big utilities that operates uh, down in Southern Florida, says, really, Federal Power Commission, you shouldn't have jurisdiction over me because I'm here at the very southern part of Florida. I don't actually transmit energy out of state. The Federal Power Commission has a couple of counter arguments. One, they say, look, all power really goes to the same interstate grid. We've talked about how actually most of the country is on that eastern interconnect that goes from the east coast out to the plains. And they say, look, that's like one big power grid. So imagine we were all around a lake putting glasses of water into the lake and taking glasses of water out of it. Even if you're on one side of the lake, maybe one bay of the lake, putting in water, really that water ultimately goes to serve everybody across the lake who's withdrawing water from the lake. So based on that idea that it's a common pool of electricity, the Federal Power Commission says, look, this is all interstate transport of electricity, interstate transmission of electricity. The second argument from the Federal Power Commission is, sure, you're not trading electricity with a power company that's right next to you that's in another state, but you are sending power north to the next utility, and they, in fact, trade with Georgia. So that way, you have electricity that eventually makes its way into interstate transmission, and so therefore we have jurisdiction over your sales. Ultimately, the Supreme Court defers to this Federal Power Commission theory. They, they say, look, we're not the electricity experts, and this is a move we're going to see often from the courts. When they are asked to resolve a question that's really about something that's solely within the agency expertise, they may say, look, agency, there's this dispute. I'm not sure you're right, but your theory at least wasn't undercut by Florida Power and Light. And so, therefore, the Federal Power Commission does have jurisdiction in this case. We actually get a dissent from Justice Douglas who says, look, on this theory, effectively, anyone who is attached to that interstate grid is going to be subject to Federal Power Commission jurisdiction. And so there really isn't much of a limit on its jurisdiction over transmission, even for what we might think of as intrastate transmission. So basically, this decision results in a relatively unlimited power for the Federal Power Commission over that, uh, over that interstate uh, transmission or even trade between two utilities in the same state. The court also, uh, the dissent also raises this sort of policy argument, which is, is there really even a need for federal government regulation in this area? This, if it's really about uh, sales just between two companies within Florida. But I think as we'll often see is the case, those kind of policy arguments aren't necessarily going to carry the day if you're going against a, uh, a regulator who's acting within the scope of their expertise. All right. Now to talk about clean energy 
cases and clean energy policy. And one of the reasons that we're going to talk about that is we're going to see different ways that it impacts with some of these federalism concerns that were raised in the previous FPC uh, case. So greenhouse gas regulation in the United States really gets its foundation through a case that's not shown in full in your book. You just have it discussed in a couple places, and that's Massachusetts versus EPA. It's a Supreme Court decision from 2007, and you can uh, see a little bit about it on page 73 in your text. Now, the origin of this case was eight years earlier, 1999. States and some ENGOs, that stands for Environmental Non-Governmental Organization. As throughout this course, we'll see a lot of acronyms. I'll try to say them out and encourage you when you're talking to people about it, don't use the acronym, just say it out. So the environmental non-governmental organizations, along with the states, file a rulemaking petition with the Environmental Protection Agency, with EPA, and they say EPA should decide whether greenhouse gases endanger public health, and if so, they should regulate them. These greenhouse gases are causing global warming, and so therefore the Environmental Protection Agency should regulate them. In 2003, this is during the Bush administration, the Environmental Protection Agency denies that petition. They say they're not going to decide right now whether greenhouse gases endanger public health, and they give two big reasons. One, they say, look, Greenhouse gases aren't like other air pollutants where they're harmful to breathe. We all breathe carbon dioxide at the, even at the elevated concentrations that there are in the atmosphere right now. We don't have a lot of reasons to think that breathing them is harmful. Really the issue is about how the carbon dioxide creates a global warming. It traps heat on the earth and that in turn creates problems. So the problem is more indirect than it would be with breathing uh, pollutants such as particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, etc. Okay, second, EPA says we want to wait for international negotiations because this is a problem that's really caused not just by emissions in the United States, but the global warming we experience here in the U.S. is really caused not just by our own emissions, but that by the emissions of every country in the world. This is something that we really want to have international negotiations about, and we don't want to have our hand forced on regulation about this by the courts. The Supreme Court rejects that argument. It's a 5-4. It's a very close decision. But Justice Stevens, writing for the court, says, look, greenhouse gases are clearly a pollutant. And Justice Stevens actually points to language in the Clean Air Act, which seems to say anything in the air is a pollutant. So as a result, he says, the Environmental Protection Agency has to decide whether greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide endanger public health. Justice Scalia, dissenting with three other justices in this 5-4 decision, says, look, it's reasonable to say this is not a pollutant, given how different it is from the other things that we count as pollutants under the Clean Air Act. And also, it's reasonable for the Environmental Protection Agency to want to wait before deciding. In 2009, at the start of the Obama administration, the Obama administration responds to this decision, and the Environmental Protection Agency finds that greenhouse gases do endanger human health and welfare due to climate change. We'll see that finding that greenhouse gases endanger human health and welfare triggers a lot of different kinds of regulation under the Clean Air Act. And we're going to talk about one of the key cases that is in your book that responds to that decision. That's American Lung Association versus EPA. It's a 2021, 2021 case uh, in the DC circuit. It's on page 67 in your books. So one part of the Clean Air Act that requires regulation if there is a pollutant that endangers public health and welfare is Clean Air Act section 111D. What that says is the Environmental Protection Agency has to create a procedure for states to create plans to control emissions from existing sources. Now that's why it may sound sort of indirect and convoluted. The reason is that usually, as we've talked about in class, the Clean Air Act mostly requires standards for new sources of emissions, new factories, new, uh, new appliances, new cars, etc. And this is about 
those existing power plants. So yeah, there's gonna be new standards for greenhouse gas emissions from new power plants. But what about those existing power plants that are already there and that emit a lot of greenhouse gases? Well, section 111D says that the states uh, sorry, that EPA should create a procedure for states to develop their own plan to address those emissions. And there's actually a lot more controversy than this about Section 111D. We could talk about it a lot. Uh, but to simplify a little bit, let's just say that that's what EPA has to do. Set a uh, procedure for states to create a plan. EPA does this through a rule that it calls the Clean Power Plan. And what that effectively does is it orders the electricity sector in each state, all those existing power plants, to hit overall greenhouse gas reduction targets. And they can do it in a lot of ways. So one thing that they could do, of course, is try to make each power plant more efficient. But EPA sets pretty aggressive goals that say, you know, we don't want you just making your power plants more efficient. What we'd also like you to do is stop running those coal power plants so often. Stop running maybe those natural gas power plants so often. Instead, use sources of electricity like renewable, maybe like nuclear, that uh, don't have greenhouse gas emissions. And so you can see how states might object to that given uh, what we see from this uh, from the statutory text, which just says EPA is supposed to create a procedure for states to create their own plan for these existing sources. Instead, what EPA adopts seems to ask for the states to make a pretty big change to their whole power sector, not just make those uh, existing power plants more efficient, but actually instead move to cleaner sources of electricity entirely. Well, apparently the Supreme Court at the time uh, thought that this was a pretty, uh, a pretty radical, pretty big move. And so February 9th, 2016, the Supreme Court on a 5-4 vote issues an unprecedented stay. What's unprecedented about it is at this point, there hadn't even been a case in the DC circuit challenging the clean power plant. That case was just starting to be considered. There hadn't been time to, uh, for the DC Circuit to reach a final ruling on that. And the DC Circuit had said, we're not gonna stop this regulation while we consider whether it's valid. But the Supreme Court, for the first time, just stepped in and said, you know what? We are gonna stop this because uh, probably the Supreme Court had concerns about its validity. Now, we don't actually know for sure what the Supreme Court said because the stay didn't come with any reasoning. And in fact, it was, as far as we know, the last act of Justice Scalia was voting on this stay as one of those five members in the 5-4 decision before he died. And so we ultimately, by the time this case came to the Supreme Court, had a very different court. We also had a, uh, a very different presidency in the interim because when the Trump administration comes into office, there's no plan that is in operation because the clean power plan had been stayed, but the Trump administration decides to repeal that clean power plan so it will never come into effect and replaces it with a rule that they call the affordable clean energy rule. At that point, the plaintiffs here challenge that affordable clean energy rule and say, you Trump administration said you had no choice but to replace, to repeal the clean power plan because you say it was unlawful. But it wasn't necessarily unlawful. And so you made your decision based on an incorrect uh, consideration, right? So it's not that you relied on your discretion to get rid of this rule. You said you were required to, and we don't think you were required to get rid of the Obama era clean power plan. The DC Circuit strikes down that rule. They say, no, yeah, you were, not a lot, you were not required to strike down the clean power plan, therefore your reasoning was invalid. That decision in turn was overruled by the Supreme Court in a decision that has come out since your book did, so it's not in your book, but it's West Virginia versus EPA, where the Supreme Court said, yes, uh, the uh, previous administration was correct that the clean power plan had not been 
had not been viable. So even though the court had changed a little bit, had some new justices since that stay, seemed that they had the same basic view of the Clean Power Plan, which was that uh, it was unlawful. So the end of that, and we'll continue to look at these uh, clean energy regulations under federal law issues throughout the course. Remember, because of Massachusetts versus EPA, greenhouse gases are still a pollutant. They still have been held to, uh, to endanger public health and welfare. They still have to be required under the clean, uh, to be regulated under the Clean Air Act, but we see that some of the specific regulations that the Obama administration had looked to adopt and that maybe uh, things that the Biden administration in its ideal world would like to adopt have been struck down or ruled out by the court. So there's a continuing struggle about what scope of authority the Biden administration has there. Okay, another way that we'll see federalism issues come up within the clean energy policy space is with states objecting to other states' clean energy policy. And to talk about that, we're going to talk about the North Dakota versus Haydinger case, which is a case from the Eighth Circuit in 2016. It's on page 338 in your textbooks. Okay, what happened in this case is Minnesota decided it didn't want to build any new coal power plants. Okay, that part of it not controversial. We don't want to build any more coal power plants. What was controversial is they said, you know, the bad thing that could happen after we ban new coal power plants is that what if other states just build their own new coal power plants and send us their coal? Then we won't really have accomplished anything. Carbon emissions from coal power, from burning coal, will be just as big. We'll just be getting that coal power imported from out of state. Now notice it's a little bit difficult to define what counts as coal power imports. Think back to that FPC case about what, where electricity really goes within Florida. Is it really in interstate commerce? Because when you have electricity crossing the border from North Dakota to Minnesota, keep in mind, remember it's typically alternating currents, so the actual electrons just go back and forth. We just, uh, we talk about, you know, the flows basically of voltage happening across across the state. So if you have that power from North Dakota traveling to Minnesota, is that coal power? You know, North Dakota also has some wind power. They have other sources of power. They transmit power from uh, longer distances. So what kind of power is really entering uh, Minnesota? Note so that it can be kind of difficult to define what part of it is coal power. Think about if you divided that lake that we talked about earlier, half and half, and you have somebody on one side, you know, pouring in the, uh, you know, some fizzy water and some regular water. By the time you get the, the water out on the other side of the lake, where are you taking out the water that was fizzy water or is it uh, regular water? Hard to say, particularly because the electricity produced from coal is completely identical to the electricity produced from solar or wind by the time it's on these transmission lines. Okay, North Dakota says, look, you can't block these imports of power. Now, what kind of arguments do you suppose they made to suggest you can't block imports of coal power? Well, one of the key arguments they made was under the Dormant Commerce Clause. I'll abbreviate it here, DCC. So the Dormant Commerce Clause, right, is really just an implication from the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which says the federal government has control over interstate commerce. And what the Dormant Commerce Clause prohibits is a couple things. One is it prohibits uh, discrimination against interstate commerce, uh, unless you know, there's a compelling uh, local reason for it. It also discriminates um, extraterritorial regulation, which is basically regulation of something that happens in another state. Now that branch of the Dormant Commerce Clause continues to be controversial. There are uh, members of the Supreme Court who don't really think that should be part of the Dormant Commerce Clause. You can imagine that sometimes textualists don't like the Dormant Commerce Clause because it's just an implication from the Commerce Clause. It's not written out anywhere. But uh, Judge Loken here says, look, this is really effectively regulating out of power sales because those coal power imports might actually um, come from sales that happen between a North Dakota and South Dakota utility, somehow that might work its way over to Minnesota. And so therefore that goes against 
the uh, dormant commerce clause because effectively it's regulating an out-of-state sale. Another argument would be that, you know, look, by the time that electricity gets to Minnesota, it's no difference between that and electricity from solar or wind. And so when you regulate the way that it's produced, in North Dakota, that's effectively extraterritorial regulation, trying to change how North Dakota produces power. So there's a couple arguments that you could imagine that this would violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. Now, the other judges don't necessarily go for that. So Judge Murphy says, look, this isn't against the Dormant Commerce Clause, but she says it's preempted by the Federal Power Act. Because remember, the federal government, the Federal Power Commission, now FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, is supposed to regulate those sales, wholesale sales of electricity in interstate commerce. So shouldn't this be regulated by FERC under that and therefore not by Minnesota? Minnesota shouldn't get to have its own rules uh, in that on that question. Okay, Judge Colleton, the third judge, says, look, I don't know whether it's against the Dormant Commerce Clause, but it is against the Clean Air Act because the Clean Air Act, which we talked about regulating carbon emissions, uh, says that states in the first instance get to make their own uh, air pollution policies that are reviewed by the federal government, but the states get to make them. So if the state gets to make its own pollution policies about how many coal power plants it has, how many natural gas power plants, et cetera, why should Minnesota be able to choose what kind of sources of power it is using to create the power that it both uses for its own use and exports uh, to other parties? Okay, now what's very interesting about this case and why uh, there has been, remains a lot of interest in this case, while it's still in your book, is that each of these reasons for why this coal power import ban was a uh, was unlawful arguably, arguably applies to the most common kind of clean energy regulation that we're going to talk a lot more about during the course. And that's what's called a renewable power standard or renewable portfolio standard, an RPS. Now, those standards effectively say when you use electricity in our state, no matter where it comes from, if it comes from in-state or out-of-state, doesn't matter, a certain percentage of it has to be renewable, right? So if you are uh, using electricity in the state, and let's say all of your power is imported, well, a certain percentage of that has to be from renewable energy. And so, you know, maybe you can have coal making up 80% of it, but at least 20% of it has to be renewable. Now think about these rationales that the judges used. I mean, in some sense, Judge Loken would say, well, wait a second, you're effectively telling them how to produce electricity in whatever state you're importing that electricity from. So that seems to violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. Judge Murphy would say, well, look, this is really, maybe it doesn't violate the Dormant Commerce Clause, but the Federal Power Act is supposed to regulate those trades of electricity in wholesale, and so this is preempted there as well. Judge Colleton says, look, you are interfering with that other state's ability to choose its own regulation. So although no court has used this to strike down a renewable power standard, in theory, those renewable portfolio standards, those renewable uh, power standards would be vulnerable to this kind of argument that you shouldn't be regulating the source of electricity imports. Note that none of this would be a problem if instead of regulating you know, what source of electricity are used, which could, could come from lots of surrounding states, states limited themselves to regulating what kind of sources of power could be produced. But states haven't done that. For the most part, they're regulating what kind of power can be used. And so that necessarily means they're regulating to some extent those imports from other states. Okay, let's think about a hypothetical and how we would address it given the different judges uh, analysis here. So what if Minnesota says, we want a new standard that says we're gonna want 50% renewable power and 25% of it has to be produced in state. Now let's think about how different states might object to that. 
North Dakota could have, again, as we discussed, the same kind of objection. Look, that basically discriminates against our coal. You're saying at least 50% of your electricity and you know, presumably uh, a large percentage of your imports can't come from coal, which is what we like to send you. So is that a discrimination by saying that in other states, they, when they import electricity, it has to comply with Minnesota's standard? Secondly, how would, imagine, a state like Illinois feel about this that produces a lot of nuclear power? So if they want to send electricity to Minnesota, they might say, look, you're really discriminating against our nuclear power, which is just as clean in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of air emissions, as your renewable power. So you shouldn't be allowed to have a regulation that basically says we can't compete for half of your market. Iowa might say, look, okay, I like the renewable power thing. I'm a big wind power producer, but why does 25% of it have to be in state? That's just discrimination. So we can see that this decision offers a lot of fodder for challenges against these very common renewable power, renewable portfolio standards that states around the country continue to use. And so that's why these federalism, these dormant commerce clause issues, these state to state and state and federal issues remain so tricky in clean energy law and why we'll see them come up again and again in our course.